Well, here we are on this snowy morning. Mm. Yeah, do a few. Do a few. It's a good idea. It's a good idea. I'll try to figure out a way to frame what I've been thinking about. Good. Maybe the slapping sound will It'll help. It'll help yeah. mesmerize my subconscious and get me cooking for a there second. Go. It's a good idea. A little bit of slap. Each, me, song, she, go, rock. Mm. Each, me, song, she, go, rock. Cool. Each. So why do we do slaps like this? There's lots of other people do different kinds of slaps. What kind of slaps do they do? Well, they do, uh, most notably, what you see in a back fall is the back fall and then rolling over the head and coming up onto the knees, right? We'll do a back fall and then tuck your head to one side and keep on going. There you go, that, they do that a lot. And that's more normal in the, in the Aikido universe and, and the, the the uh, Sistema guys, those Russian dudes, they do the same thing, but they stick an arm out sideways and stick, stick your arm out sideways. Yeah, so you have a very flat plane that you're rolling over. You're making your arm and your neck like a log right there, and you're just rolling over that plane. And it's kind of interesting to me that what got, got me stimulated about midnight last night is I'm, I'm sitting around going, geez, it's like Aikido clinic tomorrow. I have no idea what I'm going to do. So I'm sitting around last night, and I'm starting to think about uh, the shape of, of the types of training we do and why we do them. And just watching slaps this morning, it reminded me of that too, that, that basically we're doing ukimi the way we're doing it based on judo. We're doing a, a judo ukimi, basically. And you see lots of different ukimi in the world, but fundamentally this comes out of a, a, a time and, and place in, in the Kodokan where they took the top people in each of their specialties in judo and said, let's get that guy on film and let's record that and by God, that'll be the, that'll be the benchmark for the rest of the world. Because they started to take judo and export it to the rest of the world. It became an export item. And they wanted to sort of classify the top shelf stuff for themselves first before they spread it all out and then they could very easily say, wow, well, yeah, they're, you know, we're doing the real thing, they're doing the, you know, and sort of have a hierarchy. This is part of that hierarchical stuff. We're doing the top shelf ukimi thing from the Kinshu, say from the 1950s, because they took the best ukimi artists they could find, they analyzed the hell out of them, and they found out what they did and why they did it, and had them teach their lessons and codified the whole thing. And when you look around at a lot of ukimi, you'll see a lot of that backfall rollover thing. But you don't see it in our system. You don't see it so much here. It's not that it's not there. You can do it. Everybody, just try it. It's very simple. Backfall, arm out to the side, lay your head over. Head the other yeah, way. and then tip over. Yeah. Just so. See what it feels like. You'll sort it out. Yeah. Right. Yeah, you got to keep your center of gravity going. There you go. Simple. That's pretty standard. But you notice how the back of the head still has to get arranged around Neck that. Neck didn't like it. And it's a type of ukimi that's based on the idea that you're being thrown independent of somebody else and you're just rolling a, down the road like a log. So if you had to take a whole lot of momentum, like you went flying backwards off of something and there was a whole lot of speed involved, whew, you might have to do multiple repetitions of this tumbling backward type of thing. And it's closer to tumbling if you think about it. But this kind of a game, you do it straight fall. Just, straight yeah, this, yeah. Mm -hmm. Has a lot going on in it 
And it's all designed to prevent the back of the head from winding up impacting on the ground. Because this is the fall that kills folks. <laughs> this is the fall that beats the back of the head against the ground and kills folks. And it's highly normal in judo to have to take that fall. It's an osoto guard, right? So you've got the guy, you pick him up, you say, and you're taking him straight down. That's kind of nicely done, but you do it with a bit of vigor, and you're burying their head upside down into the ground, and they've got to really tightly reflex, get the chin on the chest, breathe out, and get ready for a slap. Now you do an osoto guard and you don't hold on. Woo! They have a big not get unbroken neck problem, right? And so the shape of why we're doing the particular type of ukimi we're doing owes a lot to judo. Cool. And that is part of the bigger thesis that I'm getting to anyway, which is that most of our Aikido is shaped the way it's shaped because of judo. We have, yeah? In your travels, mm -hmm. did they do that kind or our kind? Mostly they do that kind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't really see this kind of ukimi outside of judo settings, typically. But you'll see a whole lot. And when you do forward roll, do forward roll. Do your forward roll. Boom, boom. That kind of getting up. That kind of getting up. Or you do forward roll and stop at the end. Everybody does the same stop at the end. Bam. Right? That's pretty standard. But when they get up in the rest of the world, they bend the knee under. So you've probably seen lots of bend the knee under things. Nobody wants to do the bend the knee. <laughs> Go ahead. No, we, Go ahead everybody's seen the bend the knee. Well, yeah. I you mean which knee? Oh, and go down and just fold one up and then there. Oh, here we go. This thing oh, basically yeah. forms of that. They do it more elegantly. And that's, that's a way to get up easier, frankly, than to get up the way that we normally get up, which is to roll over the edge of the feet and keep the center of gravity rolling up over the long length of the legs. The reason we're doing that, again, has to do with being thrown and anticipating the fact that you're being thrown down, not rolled out. If you can always anticipate that somebody's just going to pitch you out into space and let you roll out into space, you can probably get away with tucking the knee under forever. Uh, a friend of mine had a motorcycle wreck, uh, Kwong Van Tran, back in, the, back in the early 70s or, or late 60s. And he went off his motorcycle, he was probably doing 20 miles an hour, and he'd done Aikido a long time in the uh, Ueshiba oriented system. And he went over the handlebars and he said he did probably 30 rolls. But he just stayed tucked again in that tumbling sort of form. Mm. The knees tucked up, <laughs> rolling along before the energy finally dissipated. And he could, you know, I imagine he was pretty dizzy too, yeah. you know. But boom, so you have this sort of rolling that's like that. And again, if you had a lot of force, it might be the, exactly the thing that you'd wind up doing as a default. The reason we're doing what we're doing with the legs the way we're doing it has to do with not getting the legs broken. So that if you're anticipating that you're being rolling and you've tucked your knee up and they hold on and actually throw you in an air fall, like you're doing sumiyotoshi, like you're doing shioinagi, like you're doing a big throw, boom, and your legs hit, that they hit to spread out the force and they don't impact each other. Because the downside of that rolling with the knee bent thing is that one leg can hit the other one pretty readily. Has he do want to tuck the knee under? Yeah. yeah now go back and lay that down. And come back down to your butt. Right yeah, and all the way down. Oh, yeah. Lay down flat. Right. Lay down flat. Right. Cool. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. And so we got these legs crossed up thing happening here uh -huh. in anticipation of popping up and rolling up on that leg. And that position right there is the one where they break their own legs. Because the top foot can come down on top of the bottom leg and shatter the shin. It's like a hammer hitting an anvil. And so again, judo informed them by the 1950s that there's a strong preference for that slap out position, that the feet always go to the slap out position and you roll up from there rather than crossing the legs and doing the easier way up. Because it's far easier to get up with that knee tucked under than it is coming up on the edge of the feet, right? But again, judo has described it because, again, we're doing a, a context of grappling and throwing right here. And if you happen to have th something that throws you away and rolls you out of the space, well then fine, do that, but <laughs> don't worry about it too much compared to the one that bops you right there. Cool? Cool. And so that got me thinking about Tomiki's early 
walking ideas. And his, the, the fact that when he first came out of his prison camp in, in, uh, in uh, Manchuria, in Russia, and he'd been doing his solo practice exercises, in my mind, to basically maintain his martial arts skill sets in his body as best he could without any partners for a few years in that Russian prison camp, that he was basically calling that Judo Taiso. When he started teaching it, he didn't say, oh, I'm here to teach the new Aikido thing that I've developed. No, he's teaching a Judo Taiso thing. And it has a few little differences from, from where we come from in terms of, of our ideas of walking kata. Our ideas of walking kata largely stem from the 50s and 60s and branch off from the main line of, of what Tomiki was doing. But fundamentally, they're judo exercises. They're built around a set of judo ideas. By the time we get a hold of them in our walking, we wind up with a few uh, interesting anomalies because people start applying, or, or different teachers start applying a, uh, a set of ideas to them as, as absolute rules that don't always completely make sense in terms of the form that it's describing. And so you get a, a rule like, the feet always drive the hand. So you don't want your hands wobbling around. The feet always drive the hand. And so you take a rule like that, that the feet always drive the hand, and then you try to tie it to something that basically looks like this. And you wind up with something that looks like this. That has to do with taking a, 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 an idea that becomes a strong preference of how you go about uh, uh, building a system of, of, of principle-driven Aikido and then uh, 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 collapsing everything towards those ends and you wind up with a really weird distortion. The original thing there has to do with the fact that the hands move really fast. The feet move kind of slow compared to the hands. Hands go 90 miles an hour. Your hands are really quick. The feet aren't usually 90 miles an hour shuffling around there down on the ground as we walk around. Not to say that you can't accelerate your foot, you store energy and kick real fast. But in terms of walking and preambulating, moving your ass around in normal movement, that is to say not coming out of starter blocks and exploding, right? <laughs> but normal walking around movement, feet are rather slow compared to the speed of the hands. Hands actually have to sometimes proceed. And the feet have to catch up to it. But that was tough to get across when you've made a rule about it's always driven on the speed of the foot. And so the rule kind of starts distorting things a little bit. You start seeing areas of distortion like that. You see areas of distortion like that start coming out when people apply a rule like um, this is center. We all agree that's what center is, right? It's out in this imaginary box in front of us. And yet when you try to apply that to a technique like uh, Oh, my favorite, Gaden Ate, right? I'm in center, right? And now my job is to go where? Well, my job, as far as this center is involved, is to go there. Because that's where my, it's all set up to do that. But where am I supposed to deliver energy here? Yeah, over here. And so, <laughs> the center that we're looking at is actually beside us. The center is actually going to fall this way. And the hand actually goes out into that center to do that job. So if our center is traveling here, now my hand's in center for the body falling that way. We set up this idea of center, this box in front of us, as the idea when our center is falling forward. Because most of the time we're dealing with the stuff in front of us. We're dealing with the guy in front of us, right? I have a strong preference for tackling somebody this way versus this way. <laughs> if I'm saying, I gotta fight Brad this way, that's a little problematic, you know. This is better. Right square in. So that's where that basic idea of working in the center comes from. The working in the center is really where the center of gravity is going. If the center of gravity is going back behind you, that becomes center. If anything's falling there, if the center of gravity is going here, that becomes center. If the center is falling this way, that becomes center. And so you have this. Again, collapsing into a sort of a simplistic frame of this is from the hips to the shoulders, hand right there. And we can reduce things to a basic set of rules and say, hey, this is perfect center. And it's only perfect center within a given context, right? 
And again, it's a context strongly driven by the fact that judo has a big preference for going right here, <laughs> right? That likes to deal with this right here. Likes to deal with right in front of you and working with right in front. So my head's going on. It's about one in the morning now. And, huh. I'm thinking about balance break. And I'm thinking about how, how um, I had a conversation years ago when I first started seeing videos of the other Tomiki systems out there. The first shocking thing to me, well, the second shocking thing, the first shocking thing was looking at Mr. Tomiki himself doing the walk and then looking at it and going, God, his walk's all wrong. That was my first shocking thing. Damn, we have brown belts do the walk better than Mr. Tomiki. I mean, that's exactly what went through my head because the simplistic frame that I had learned had defined things so tightly as to what counted as correct that when I would go back and look at him himself, it looked all screwed up, right? <laughs> and other people might have had, I don't know if you ever looked at the old stuff that way, but. I remember just looking at a few and going, huh, same thoughts. This is very yeah. strange, yeah. yeah. The second weird thing that I noticed when I looked at their kata, I looked at Tomiki and Oba doing kata. It was probably a film they shot in the 70s, 75, I think. Well, their balance breaks are all wrong. What's going on? The balance breaks. He's doing a lot of, well, I'll tell you exactly what he's doing. As the hand's coming in, he's going here. Or he's going here. And sometimes he's going here. There's a lot of stepping left off the line or stepping back. This sort of thing. And I was like, even Shomanate, kind of interesting. Hold on a second. Get my glasses. Even Shomanate. Here. Right. Well, by golly, we have a thing where I'm walking forward and he's walking forward and I have to I have to go over here. My right foot's got a track, right? I have balance break that's just going boom. Yeah? Or I have balance break that's going boom. But it's all forward driven. It's always on the walking step, always going forward. And it has a strong predilection for turning in the first step on contact. That's the big deal that we do a whole bunch of the first few years. So I'm looking at Tomiki doing all this with Oba, and he ain't doing any of that. Maybe one technique out of, out of 17 has something like that in it. And even if you look at the modern forms, the, the people like uh, Nariyama, and you look at uh, Shishida, and you look at Sato, the, the, the top end Tomiki teachers of this day and age in Japan, you're seeing mostly the same kind of balance breaks. Occasionally, I think on some of them do this when they go to a shirawate. They cut across. But that's about it. They don't do that. They don't do that forward stepping action that often. So I scratched my head and I went to my teacher. This is back in the 90s at some point, because that's when I first encountered this stuff. I said, man, Tomiki ain't doing a balance break. Where did that come from? And he told me that it came from his own preference for doing Osotogari in Judo. That when he would set up Osotogari, he would cue off their right foot hitting the ground, boom, right there. And he liked to turn the guy and then make his throw go right there. And so it's a strong preference for as the guy's coming in, well, I want to get him over here so I can do that to him, <laughs> right? That was his Takui Waza. That was his Takui. And so his subconscious was already triggered for doing that right off the bat. That a serious threat's coming in. I want to get this guy 90 degrees. I want to get him in a place where I can tear his leg out from over there. And that is why we have the type of preference for this balance break. Which does what? Puts her right here in a convenient location for Miles Sotogar. Right? And that has, was sort of occluded. That was never really discussed in broad open discussion of where that came from or why it was like that. But that's the explanation I got. And I went, oh, well, that's cool. And I just sort of filed it away. But as I was thinking about how judo has shaped our Aikido, particular preferences of judo, because Tomiki himself was a judo guy. And his particular ways of stepping in response to attack 
started tinkering in my mind, well, what is he doing there? Why is he preferring these other ways to this strong standardized way that I'm so used to? Because his is largely driven off the left step. It's largely starting static as the man's coming in. He's going to come hit me. And they actually, in the old films, they actually had this spear hint sort of attack coming up at a little greater distance. This closes the distance a little bit, opens the distance up a little bit. And so again, you have differences in my that are creeping in here as to where, when we, do I, do I make my evasion right there? Or do I make my evasion right there? Earlier films, it's all right here. And late, by the 70s, you're getting more sort of like that. But you really don't see this except in our system where you start with this really tight parameter. That's something that evolved later, I think probably in the 80s or 90s from Texas. But that's where it was beginning right there. Cool? So the attack was coming in, and at the moment of attack, you have this left foot fading. Come on in. Boom. Boom. You have this sort of thing. Out over his little toe. Right there. So I'd like you to just experiment for a few minutes. Just with that. Right at my, but slightly extended. Right? Right at the end of his range of being able to touch you at all. And as he steps forward to come straight to my face, I'm going to take my left foot out and back a little bit and tractor him just over the line of that little foot. Cool. Okay, feel it. A little greater range than normal, right? His foot comes in, boom, just over here, right over that little toe. Right here. Good. Boom. Yeah, that's it. Good. Boom. <laughs> Good. Oh, there we go. Right over this little tongue. It's the left foot moving. Left foot moving. Pair up and do some repetitions of just that little piece. Just that little piece. It's huge for him. He has lots of different variations on that. Sometimes it's more backward like we just did. Sometimes it's more lateral. But we're going to play with that a little bit and see what kind of arrives in terms of thinking about it as a balance break in judo and how it affects what he was doing with his Aikido as compared to what we've been doing with our Aikido for the past 20, 30 years. Cool? Questions? Okay, try. Just get, get apart. It is somewhat important that when we step back in this line, we're tractoring on an imaginary dotted line from his back foot, from his front foot to his little toe out here, and we're extending him just enough to keep his back heel up in the air. All right? If we go too far, if I go, He's going to walk through it, right? If I go too shallow, I don't get much action out of him. He's just kind of there. I want just enough. You're looking for just enough. To get his foot still has a little traction, his toes still trying to grip the ground. It's like, ah, almost there. And that's how you tell if you got it right. It's like, oh, there's this little, the back foot is still trying to grip the earth. If the back foot comes off the ground, it'll swing through readily. And when that happens, the center of gravity is doing a different job. We'd really like to hang him, yeah, right there. So his toe is still engaged. If it goes this far, too far. Cool? So just try to tinker with that a little bit. Your distance in that back step, in this left foot going back, if they're giving you a right hand. If you're doing left hand, be going this way. Cool? Okay, go ahead. So, and everything. Yeah. Right, right, right. And I was, I was, right, I was taking multiple steps mm -hmm. when Dale was attacking me because I mm -hmm. guess subconsciously I wanted to see him off balance right then. Right. Of, wait, wait, wait. So well, finally. Here's something that comes to mind with all that. We're very addicted to balance break being a big damn uh, thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> right? <laughs> to being a big postural distortion. Because of the preference for that type of balance break where everything goes and comes back to here, it's this big sort of roller coaster you put people on. This is a much smaller roller coaster. This is just a little thing compared to that big thing. This is really just, it's quite a bit more subtle, really, as an opening thing. It's to just reach out, and if you're thinking in judo, to reach out and as his foot comes in, just, just enough to put him right here in space. I'm not looking for something that's going to dump him down into this hole. I'm just looking for something that's going to hang him on a wire. It's sort of like perching him on a wire. Suddenly, they're here, they're cool, and now they're standing on a damn tight wire. And it's more akin to putting somebody on a tight wire than it is to 
stuffing them in a hole and bringing them back out. But yeah, other whole things. A lot less energy too. It, yeah, yeah, if you was, think about how much energy is transmitted in a balance brake shearing this way, how many foot pounds of force of your body colliding into that shearing action? Yeah, if I'm not fading in, if I'm not going forward, if I'm actually uh, giving ground slightly <laughs> right here, it's very light at the hands. It's already lighter at the hands than this sort of thing. That's very good too. Anything else you guys know? Okay, with the judo, are you? As one practices judo, which I don't. Mm -hmm. um, but I think you do. That's sort of my point. Well, yeah, and then You're doing judo all along, and you don't day. know yeah, it. So that right. was kind of interesting. But, okay. uh, you know, from where our balance break came from, yeah. as opposed to this old one. Yeah. In judo, is the general idea just to get them a teeny bit off at first, or is it to look for the big hole? As you there, there are judo ways to do years. this into a big throw. Absolutely. It's it's. Um, was one or the other emphasized? No, it's used lots of different ways. Used lots of different ways. Um, what I see with the way Mr. Tamiki was applying it in this oldest film, the film from 1952, it's the black and white film, the same one that had all the judo taiso in it when I taught that a few years, or was it two years ago, or one year ago? Wow, it seemed a while back. That same video, if you look at that and go past the stuff that looks like early forms of releases, you'll see a bit that goes into early stuff from, from his ideas going into Sankata, obviously. And then you get this part that looks like prototypal, prototypical stuff that was heading toward the 17. The attacks are all like this coming in. And the balance breaks, that's the first set of balance breaks I started looking at. I went back to the oldest film and started looking at how he was moving his feet for that. And he set it up. The first two techniques we'll do with this, just so that you can contextualize it into a more IQ framework. The man's coming in, he's gonna hit us in the nose, we're gonna do this little balance break we're doing stepping back. Then he would then cycle and do Oshi to Oshi. And he'd get to here, kind of as the guy's collapsing, into this line, and then he would stretch him out. Those were both salient features. That it, it wasn't the direct push through the ear, drive him in the long line thing that we've learned to come and know and love so easily. But rather this little back step, control the elbow, this back leg comes through, over the top, and then out to the side. All right? And then he did it on the other side. The left hand would come out, and he would replicate this same process. And as it would go down, boom, out to the side. So he did Oshi Doshi right and left. That's the first two techniques in this set on that old 52 film that he did. So I'd suggest you try that. Here we go. We're going here, boom, cycling through, elbow to the ear, pretty standard stuff for us over the top and down, and when you hit down, stretch out. So it's not an elongated ride through in a long push like this. Boom, I'm sorry. Here we go. Here. I did too hard, didn't I? <laughs> Try again. Here, there we go. Oshi Toshi begins. We go over the peak. As soon as we get over the peak, out to the side. Cool, it's kind of neat. Yeah. Boom. Ah. Okay. Back step. Here we go. Oshi Toshi begins. I go up through her ear, out to the side. Cool. It's very distinctive. Hmm. 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 There we go. Cool. Try it right and left. See if you can. I'd start just with the right hand attack for a little while and then translate over to the left once your body's caught the back step thing a little bit. Cool? Good, try. Try, try, try. Right. So it's, it's the directionality, the slipping sideways thing at the end is something I first noticed out of the Daitoru stuff that had to do with taking that base out from under. They're, they're, they're getting shaped like a table and we're taking a table leg out from under them and we're whew, running out to the side. And it's, um, it's really great for getting rid of these long engagements when she's pushing this. Yeah. And then, yeah. Good. and I just walk off like that. As I go over the peak, out to the corner, you're doing that same kind of tickle off the little edge of the toe balance break again, basically. And you just think about stretching them out and seeing how long their arm gets. Cool? Great. Cool. It's a little comparing. Anything else compared to our standard Oshi Doshi that we're used to? Well, it's less of a war. 
And so you, you, mm -hmm. you're busy thinking about getting your technique right as opposed to winning. Mm -hmm. and, and if you get your technique right, it's like any sweet spot. It's like hitting any sweet spot. All right. of a sudden, there's nothing there. And so right. you know by the nothing there that you're getting it right. So mm -hmm. it's no longer a, a war. It's, it's got to be right out. because if it's wrong, when I pick up this foot from the back leg, she can pressure through this and stop me. All right? Because it's coming from a weak place. This back leg stepping through a yumiyashi is... We've preferred this all along because, man, I can drive from hell. But here I'm saying, man, I've got to be able to pick up this back leg and still operate with it. So if I get jammed up here, for instance, and I try to do it from the back leg, she can fight. There you go. Yeah. She can lean through that elbow and stop a big old fat guy like me. So it's, it's, uh, it's got some feedback built into it saying that, yeah, you better be right in this line. To make that step through right there. That that if you start already in the line, you don't have to cycle through. You're not going to be in the same vulnerable place as you are when you're trying to get there from here. Out here, whew, it's already starting on him. It's already starting on him from way back there. So it's a much longer stretch of a drop. You have this much space to put the the balance break into their top, into their body rise with, versus about that much space to put it in with. Cool? So it's pretty different that way. The other one he did, right off the bat, was Hikiotoshiki Taoshi. And he did it sideways. So the foot, so left foot, again, is going, <laughs> yeah, going sideways, back sideways. More often than not, what I would see Basically, sidestep. <laughs> and one hand's feeding the other. Right feet to left, sideways. Right feet to left, sideways. Maybe a little back sometimes. His feet change sometimes. Sometimes it tracked it back a little bit. But it's almost immediate. It's almost immediate. Oh. Cool. That's interesting. Yeah, isn't that interesting? Yeah. <laughs> Very different. Very different. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. None of all that other stuff that we have to do to get him to fall. Yeah. He's not starting from a sort of guard. Yeah. None of He's starting from a different place in his Kukui ideas or his balance break idea. Right. Right. And so this is cutting out a lot of the steps that we do normally which is the preference of coming across them. Right. Which again is back to throwing her here. If you get across them, then you have to come up with some justification for getting You either got to go back shot. or you got to keep going. So if you go across them, my preference anymore, if you do the cr go across them for them, then just keep going. <laughs> you wind up all the way around them. In the old days, we had a lot of this. <laughs> all right. uh -huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. Trying to get back to where he went to begin with is what it amounts to. Right. Do the balance break, then jump back to where Tomiki went in the first step, which is hard to do. It's hard to go all the way over here and then jump all the way back to this side and get it. But that's fundamentally what we wound up doing for a while. Basically, because of that preference for a particular line and direction, um, we wound up with a, a balance break that went this way and then it came back. But you don't have to. You can keep going that way. And if you're going to do the balance break forward, I do really recommend going all the way forward and around. Just keep on track. But if you're doing Mr. Tomiki's thing, left foot sideways, hand it over, and go straight here. Cool? Cool. So try that. Try a little bit. Right and left, same thing. The, the Initial step, lateral, or maybe slightly back. As Dale said, there's a whole range from here to here to here to here, right? There's, like if we took the, uh, the protractor and went dotted line, da 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 there's a, big, there's a big sweeping zone right here, and there's lots of balance breaks that live in it. And he never went to one space every time for one thing. I mean. He, Sometimes he was more here, but more often than not with this one, he was more lateral right from the beginning. 
And I just, I think it's kind of nice. So play with it a little bit. Play with it. Sort of like our balance brake going completely the other way, right? Instead of this way, it's going that way. That's right. Big round thing, right? But there's this timing we're used to. This really is about a half step. <laughs> so it's, it's quite a bit more sudden. It's more abrupt. If we're, if we're kind of very used to taking this big ride that has to go over there and then come back and all. Yeah, let's put a finger here. That's all it takes. And I like that you can, in fact, if you haven't tried it, try it with one finger. His coming in. I got one finger, the magic finger of Ike Doom. And the Ike Doom <laughs> finger is tied with this foot. Opposite hand and foot. Going lateral, going completely sideways. <laughs> and as Dale said, hey, I don't even need to necessarily pass it off to this other hand. You can say, wow, you can just go and just put your back of your arm on them and keep them going down, which is true, kind of cool. But try it. Try it with just one finger, lateral step, dropping action. Now, I still like to pass it off to this hand because I kind of am very fond of walking a Tommy backwards. Oh, oh. We've and talked about walking a tummy forwards yes. and how it goes into dropping them on their head. Mm -hmm. Walking a tummy backwards, same game, dropping them on their head. So I like to get this arm involved with it just because that gives me that particular ending, uh, which is my preference, frankly, that comes from judo. <laughs> that if you're going to have a judo match and you can start with them planted face down on the floor like this with their arm by, behind them, that's a great way to start a judo match. He comes out for grips and immediately he's down there kissing the floor for you. Not a bad way to start. Go from there. So yeah, I just have that purpose. But you don't have to. This would be more, this is cool. What Dale said, yes, just go like this. That's right. I just don't have a hold of it anymore. I don't have a piece of it. I can't tear something off and chew on it for a while like a mean dog. If you do it like that, he's still kind of out there on his own. It's nicer. I'm just not as nice. So anyway, I pass it to this hand so that I get a little more control a little longer, right? But you don't necessarily have to. The cool part to me is that he's doing it with such a light touch. It could be one finger. It's the way your arm falling. If I try to accelerate it down or push extra down, if I try to go, <clears throat> I tend to settle people into their feet. If I go, <clears throat> I do extra pressure down. Now I'm coiled down, he's coiled down, everything's crumpled into a squishy thing. But I can't remember exactly where it came from, but there was, in one of these long lists of bits that I've been researching over the past few years of parameters of what kind of, what, what are the uh, uh, ranges of how much pressure or how much distance or how much grip or how much this or how much that, to really tighten Aikido down to a, a more finessal thing. The one thing I found that was pretty helpful, if I put my arm up in space and then let it fall, so it's hanging in space and you just let it drop, that amount of weight, that's the weight. <laughs> and again, you see that in judo, it's kind of cool. We're out here with grips and we're moving through space and I let this fall. Go ahead and get a real grip. There we go. That's what killed him over there. That if I let this collar grip just fall on his step, I wind up controlling. Kind of a neat exercise. We're in grips, we're walking, his foot hits the ground, I let my hand go. I didn't pull it down. I let it fall. She's tied to it here. That's brought her into a hole. Automatical. Pretty cool. The weight of the arm falling. Cool. So we can add that exercise. But the weight of the arm falling is what we have here too. Arm falls. It's not a bunch of pressure down. It's not like shoving it down hard. It's like letting your arm fall through space. And just define that, that amount of pressure for yourself as you do the body drop stepping sideways. Cool. Couple more so, minutes. In the next little bit, oh, was there more feedback about that thing? Anything else you guys want to talk about or cover with that? That was just cool. It is cool. <laughs> it the is more cool. relaxed, the more it seems to work. Right. Just relax. It's, it's a very light, relaxed thing, and it tickles them. 
it's, everything's out here at arm's length. We're not all bunched up. That's something else that jumps out at me about this. That, Which is not that it's happening judo. at arm's distance. Yeah, I mean. To me, he described it as judo at arm's length. Judo at a great distance. Hamare judo. The kaku taise, this great span of space. That normal judo is happening in this thing. He's talking about judo happening at this thing. And so it's all happening out here. Like he's in a big bubble and I'm in a big bubble. And it's all at that seam of where the two bubbles are in contact. At that distance that we think of as mine happens like that. His form of Kota is significantly that way too. So it's Dale's coming in. And there, there's no big fall with this, by the way. It's just a turn around, lay down, backwards fall sort of. We have this balance break that looks just like the Oshitoshi thing we did at the start. And then from here, he just migrates around the outside edge of this ball and turns the hand over and lets him sit down out there. That's very much what you see. Back step thing, like we went to the Oshitoshi place, the very first one we did. Mm -hmm. And then probably, although he did, it, it's not described this way, but obviously I'm having some difficulty in this direction, so I just rotate around. Anyway, but I keep the open span. I, I'm very cautiously not running into this range in here. Everything's staying out at the end of the arms. Everything's staying very far out. There's more foot movement in this. There is more foot movement in this one. Boom. And then just make this a point in space and rotate around it. A little compression on the backside. Not a very strong, not trying to clamp down or anything. Boom. Boom. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Feel it. Boom. Way out in space. Cool. You do it. I do. Okay. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Ah, pretty good. <laughs> All right. And good. What I think is kind of interesting here is probably sometimes I noticed in the old films. Oboe would start to make a fist, the uke, would start to make fists, to make a strong position here. And I, I suspect that part of this is just that if you, they have a, a line of tension and they're fighting in this range, you keep that same thing out there. And I'm not ever twisting your wrist. <laughs> I'm turning my whole body around this strong plane. So he has a very flat structure here. He's not going to let this bend. I'm, if I try to grab this and twist it, good luck. But as I turn my whole body around it, it goes there automatic. So you might experiment with that. But let Uke have a powerful wrist here. Right. And if you were to just grab it and try to twist on this thing, he can, he can kill that. But we're just turning our body around it in this push. That's also what is indicated by the type of Ukimi Ova's taking. We're not seeing a big flip right here. We're seeing a uh, crumple to the back. And I suspect that it's because he's doing it this way to avoid any sort of manipulation of the wrist thing, trying to break the wrist down. We're not trying to break the wrist down with our grip at all. We're doing it with our whole body turning. Cool. So you take out all the manipulation at the wrist level. It's all happening in the feet. Great. Try it. Try it. Okay, can have around it. So this one has even less of the back step thing. This could be left step and even slightly forward, right? And then rotating around. Yeah. 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 There we go. That's, that's a bit more like it. It's a bit more like it. I probably emphasize that back step too much on this particular one. It's that the left foot is going out and establishing this sort of relationship. But it's establishing it from the side rather than. So he's coming forward. And I'm going here. I'm going to balance break position. But I'm going to it, not cutting him across to here. I'm turning myself in relation to it. Okay? And then you have some sort of ooh, overwhelming thing. Get out of the way of that thing. Turn. And let the hands basically stay in the